Hi, I'm Ted Wolf, presented by Guidewise. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast, where we connect you to the stories and insights of people who have mastered implementation. Why? Because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Join us as we uncover the secrets of successful implementation so you can conquer your implementation struggles. Welcome to the Implementers Podcast presented by Guidewise, where we talk a lot about the topic of implementation because ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. Today, my guest is Siobhan McHale. Siobhan has a very impressive background. She was an executive and she led a radical seven-year change initiative at the Australian New Zealand Banking Group Limited, ANZ. Um, in that effort, she transformed it from the lowest performing bank in the country to one of the highest performing and most admired banks in the entire world. Professor John Carter used her with the ANZ um, experience as a Harvard Business School case study designed to teach MBA students about managing change. Today, we live in a world of nonstop change and disruption. So I would like to welcome Siobhan McHale to the podcast today. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Great to be um, here. I'd like to start out, if I could, um, I'd like to be able to focus in on your book, The Hive Mind at Work. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Siobhan, and your role and how you came about that particular title for your book? Yeah, so I'm the executive in, in charge of people, culture and change at Dulux Group in Australia, uh, headquartered in Australia. But really, I started my career um, in organisational psychology. That's what I studied. And before that, even as a child, I was fascinated by uh, bees as they swarmed in the orchard on my family's farm in Southern Ireland. And this fascination with bees and, and natural ecosystems led me to a focus in my studies in organizational and organizational psychology on how human ecosystems function. Uh, I went on from from that to a decade as a consultant at Accenture and PricewaterhouseCoopers, and then I really wanted to roll my sleeves up and become the executive in charge of transformation, so really become an insider rather than an external person looking in on the organisation. So uh, that's really been my career as the executive in charge of transformation in a series of international firms. That's excellent. Excellent experience. I found your book very, very enlightening, and it also offered a few different structural ways of looking at a business. One of them that really struck me and struck a great chord with me is your concept and your idea of group intelligence, or GQ. Could you explain what that means? Yes, so GQ is the ability to be able to understand and intervene in groups in order to enable them to perform, to grow, or to adapt. And really this concept came about by examining how organizations, how we, how we see organizations and how they function. And in the past, you know, if you, if you think about the history of, um, research into organizations, we saw organizations as machines. So back in um, Isaac Newton's day, really talking about hierarchy and command and control, and that evolved with some of um, Taylor's work, Frederick Taylor's work, really seeing organizations almost like clock-like mechanisms where, you know, you, you pulled, pulled a lever and humans were just cogs in the wheel. And in that world, and um, you required IQ or intellectual intelligence in order to manage the machine. And human beings, well, they were just cogs, cogs in the big machine. Then we moved on to um, some of the work by J.A. Barnes, who is an anthropologist uh, studying a village in Norway. And he 
emerged the thinking that really it was all about social networks and organizations were social networks where you had influencers in this village who had more connections with others. So um, organizations were about connections and nodes of connection where you really were building relationships with other people. And it was all about emotional intelligence, which was EQ. And that um, was even bolstered further by Daniel Goleman's work on emotional intelligence when he published his book in 1998. But I believe there's a, a third intelligence or a third way called group intelligence, which is really about organizations as ecosystems where you need to understand not just relationships, but relatedness between the parts. And you need to understand the group dynamics and be able to intervene in groups in order to help them to adapt, grow and deliver. So is the group intelligence just the collective mindset of the business in effect of all the groups and different individuals and if that is the case, how do you get them to communicate with each other and how do you read that communication? Yes. So group intelligence, I say, exists at the collective level, but it also exists at the individual level. So you get it at the systemic level, but you also get it at the individual level. So yes, groups have their own intelligence and um, individuals can contribute to that if they understand how to operate in a group and they understand how to navigate in a group. And the analogy I use is bees. You know, bees have this collective intelligence where um, when the hive is overcrowded, they know that they must go in search of a new home. And actually, my book, The Hive Mind at Work, talks about this and the fact that um, we can learn a lot from the bees and how how they um, find a new home using their collective intelligence. So in organizations, we need to harness this more, but we are so consumed with IQ and EQ that we haven't really developed our group intelligence or GQ skills. So does IQ and EQ actually feed and guide, if you will, group intelligence? Yeah, I always say it's a great question, Ted. I always say it's not an either or. So you're not trying to replace IQ and EQ. You're actually saying it's an and. You need all three. You need your IQ in order to be able to solve very, you know, technical problems. Um, so you need EQ in order to be able to relate interpersonally with, with other people, with other individuals. But e IQ and EQ are necessary, but they're not sufficient for the, the complexity and the complex ecosystems that we are navigating in today's world. So um, people who have GQ, group intelligence, are much more able to, to do that navigation. And one of the examples I use in the hive mind of work is um, Albert Borla, who was is the CEO of Pfizer. And when COVID struck in March 2019, he began to look at what was required in order to produce a vaccine. And that vaccine needed to be produced in record time. And the previous record for a vaccine was four years to develop the mumps vaccine. And uh, that was too long. So Borla adopting group intelligence began to notice what was going on within the ecosystem. And one of the things he noticed was that people were operating in silos. So there was siloed thinking and people working exclusively in their silos. So whether they were working in big pharma or companies or whether they were working in university departments or whether they were individual researchers, they were each sort of burrowing down into their silos. And he developed a manifesto and one of the key tenants, the five key tenants of that manifesto was collaboration. So no matter where you were in the ecosystem, collaboration became the governing principle. So people began depositing all of their research and their knowledge and the, what they were gathering into these online depositories and sharing all this information. And within nine months, Pfizer had developed um, a vaccine for COVID-19, which was um, 
a, a record uh, for, for producing a vaccine. So this ability to understand mm -hmm. the ecosystem, understand the patterns that were governing that ecosystem and to be able to intervene in order to allow that ecosystem to rewire itself and get a different result. That's a great example of group intelligence. And how would a hierarchy or managers work within that group intelligence? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. And I think traditional hierarchies can struggle, but you've got to look at the roles and the relatedness between the parts. So for example, when we were working at the ANZ Bank in um, that you mentioned in your introduction, uh, one of the things we noticed at the ANZ Bank was there was a hierarchy. So essentially head office uh, was telling the 700 branches within the bank exactly what to do. So head office had stepped into role of order giver and the 700 branches had stepped into the role of order taker. And the pattern or shared agreement between those different parts of this hierarchy was we, you know, we take the orders and we do what we're told. So this order taker pattern was governing the whole organization. So we had to see that pattern before we could intervene. And in fact, before we saw the pattern, the executives had been restructuring the organization and trying everything that they could do to bring about change without success. But seeing that pattern allowed us to intervene in that organization and make change. So we reframed the role of the head office from order giver to enabler. So their role was to enable the branches to deliver better customer service. And we reframed the role of the branches to customer service delivery. Um, and that made all the difference. We started to see that it moved from this very hierarchical organization to this much more like an ecosystem where each part plays its role, not a top-down command structure. So. Let's say that I am an order receiver in the branch bank and I get an order down from headquarters and they tell me what to do and I'm used to working in that way. I just fulfill the order taken from mm -hmm. somebody else. So now all of a sudden we want to be able to understand group think. How do I, how do I know how to change my behavior and what would that be, new behavior look like working in this new, new paradigm, if you will? Yeah, that's... Um such an important point. So one of the things I talk about in the hive mind at work is being able to design interventions that bring about change. And what are those interventions? Because it's not about emotional intelligence, really. It's about how do you take up a new role? So a key um, tool in your armory and reframing can happen at an individual or a collective or a group level. And reframing is really about changing the mental map that people have about their role. So your role is not necessarily, it's not your job description role. The role I'm talking about is your role in the ecosystem. So for example, if you get up in the morning and uh, you say good morning to your wife and role of husband, you might go down the corridor and meet your children and step into role of father. And um, again, you, you know, you go into work, you might step into role of boss, you might then meet your superior and step into role of subordinate, you might have some meetings with your team members where you step into role of collaborator. Um, in, in one meeting, you could be in role of negotiator for, for an increase to your budget. In another role, you could uh, another meet coach to your uh, to a team that needs assistance. In a, in a third meeting, you might be in role of reviewer or critic of a new proposal. Uh, and then after work, you might meet up with some old school friends and, and step into role of listener. So talker even. So mm -hmm. role um, and the, the mental map that we have of our role influences our behavior in a way that is just as powerful as personality. And yet um, we've been sort of taught that personality governs behavior, but this concept of role is really important. So during change at the ANZ Bank, for example, we had to reframe the role of the people in the branches from role of sort of victim, and I'm just here taking the orders and I, you know, I have no control, to actually um, thinking of themselves as being 
the real owners of the customer experience. Um, so that is almost like you're giving people the role map that they have is almost like a GPS in a car. It um, it guides you. It shapes where you go. It shapes how you how you behave on an everyday basis. So we actually rolled out workshops to the thirty two thousand staff at at A and Z, the employees, and and taught them about how to take up up this new role. So that was um, a major intervention into the ecosystem that helped that change to occur. So. If you can, could you explain what the intervention or some of the exercises or some of the change management concepts that you introduced to those 32,000 employees to help them ease into this new way of this new paradigm of doing business and conducting themselves throughout the day? Yeah, there was a, a different activities, but I think the main thing is to um, make sure that the reframe happens. So it's, it's really about... Um, allowing people to understand and start to redraw their mental map of their role. So they have one mental map of their role, which is I have no control. I'm just sitting here in the branch. I'm a victim. And the next mental map of their role is actually you have control. This is your role. You are the custodians of the customer. You are here to serve them. How are you going to take up that role? So the first part is to reframe the role. The second part is to allow them to rewire their brain around this new role and start to create a new picture of what that looks like. So a lot of the exercises were were involved in reframing uh, redrawing mental maps and not just having it as a one-off sheep dip, but actually keeping keeping the the foot on the change accelerator by having different ways to reinforce that role. So that reinforcement might have occurred with them. Um, we rolled out new a new look to the branches. We revamped them. We brought in new branding. We brought we actually had everybody from head office as well spend a day at least a day every six months at a branch so uh, they could step into the shoes of the people who were working day to day in the branches and they began to see the long queues of customers the frustration that customers were having with the lack of answers the just the 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 angst that the, the the branch staff were facing on an everyday basis, not having the right tools, not having the right systems. So we started to put in new tools and systems to allow the branches, the, the employees in the branches to take up this new role. So the infrastructure around mm -hmm. the change had to be there as well. So it sounds, and correct me if I'm wrong, just so that I can understand this myself better and grasp the idea, but when you go in and you do the reframe, in effect, what you're doing is you're, you're reframing the thoughts and beliefs the person has about their particular role and function. And when you reframe it, it you change their world, but you also point out their importance. So in effect, you're combining the IQ and EQ together there. And the result is everybody starts thinking together in a different way. And that's the group conscious consciousness or group intelligence that's coming through how does that work with culture yeah culture is a very interesting subject and i've actually written my first book was the insider's guide to culture change so it's quite um, similar culture is about how the organization functions and um it, it is very connected because culture is about those patterns of operating and what gets embedded in an organization and the things that often we become blind to. So you're working on the culture at the same time. But in terms of GQ, it's really about looking at how the ecosystem is operating and at the highest level, what are the roles of the parts of that ecosystem? And um, an, another example that I can give you was at an infrastructure company where um, they were really struggling with um, poor customer satisfaction ratings. And um, they were about to under, you know, they're basically making the assumption that um, the customers were dissatisfied because the equipment or the fleet that they had was out of date. So I said, well, hang on before, 
before you jump to buying a new fleet. Let me go in and take a look at what's going on. So I went to one of their contracts, um, which was in a gold mining, an old gold mining area of country, Victoria in Australia. And they were laying cable for internet, for internet connection for a government client in that region. But um, there were delays in the contract because they hadn't actually uh, thought about what equipment they needed to get through the hard quartz rock in that in that uh, country region. Um, and this was not just happening on this contract. They were stuck in a reactive, what I call a reactive pattern. So everybody was really not planning ahead, not seeing what was required in terms of equipment on projects, but sending in the firefighters later on to compensate for that lack of planning. So one part of the organization was in reactive thinker mode and the other part was in rescuer, coming in to rescue and, and get the contract back on track. And, and uh, that pattern of we react rather than plan ahead was actually running the firm. So seeing that pattern allowed us to have a different response and allowed us to put a different operating model in place. So um, we started to put in teams to review contracts, to see risks and to plan ahead to manage those risks. So that's just another example of understanding how the group was operating, what are the big patterns that are running the group or the ecosystem and how you intervene in order to shape those patterns. So rather than a technical intervention, buy new equipment, there was a different type of intervention, which is re rewire the ecosystem and reframe the role of the parts. So when you are looking and I'll say reading and observing the GQ, what role does the rumor mill in an organization play in that GQ understanding? Yeah, the rumor mill is is always fascinating because you can pick up a lot about what's really going on in an organization through the rumor mill and uh, what happens, you know. So when you're, you're absolutely right, when you're assessing an organization and part of having group intelligence as an individual leader is being able to go in there and tap into what's really going on in this organization and not jumping to conclusions, but tapping into what's the rumor mill saying? What am I observing as I'm going around? You know, it's a bit like um, the infrastructure company, rather than moving straight to let's buy new equipment, I went out and did some site visits mm -hmm. and noticed, ah, this is interesting, the, the contract's falling behind. Why are they not, why aren't they sticking to their schedule? Oh, they haven't got the right equipment. Why don't they have the right equipment? Didn't they know that this was a territory where there was hard quartz rock? Yes, they did. Why didn't they see that? Ah, because they're not planning. They're not planning effectively. They're just rushing uh, to conclusions. And then they're bringing in the firefighters to compensate and, and save the day. And, you know, the whole organization loved these firefighters. They loved the rescuers. They loved a crisis. And it just kept repeating itself. So it's this ability to be able to tap into multiple sources in order to be able to see what's, what's running the ecosystem including the rumor mill. So when you go into an organization, how does an individual start to perceive the GQ? How do they start to understand it? What is it they look for? What are the guideposts or the sign markers? Yeah, I think one of the things you look for is where is the noise, you know, and what is that noise telling us? And what, yeah, seeking multiple perspectives on that noise. So rather than putting on an EQ lens, so let's say you went into the ANZ bank and you, you know, you noticed that the bank had the worst customer satisfaction rates in the whole country. Um, one of the interventions you could say, oh, well, let's train the staff to be able to have better relationships with the customers you know the eq so you you know you you have better questions or you build a better relationship that wouldn't have worked um so you've got to be able to take this 
uh, balcony perspective, which is stepping back from it, noticing what what what's going on in this part. So what's going on in head office? What's going on in the branches? And importantly, what is the agreement between those two parts of the the organisation or the ecosystem? So the agreement in the A and Z was that the branches. Uh, take orders from head office. That was the big agreement that was running the organization. So that wouldn't be fixed by putting employees through customer service training. You had to shift that agreement between head office, who was in order giver role, and the branches in order taker role. And lots of organizations sort of focus just on let's sheep dip people, let's put them through training, somebody's to blame, uh, the, you know, the branches aren't, uh, they're grumpy and they're no good at customer service, um, but that, that wouldn't have fixed the problem. So you've got to dig deeper, see the underlying patterns would be my answer to that question, Ted. So in your years of experience, and you obviously are very well experienced in all of this, why do you think so many workplace change efforts fail to deliver? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I notice, if if I ask um, managers about change, what they'll say is, oh, yeah, they, they'll look back on the change and they'll say, oh, I went from point A to point B to point C. And it sounds like a very logical step-by-step journey, but it's actually never that way in reality it's it's usually a very tw- twist you know twists and turns on that on that journey and the reason that um changes fail is that managers bring a technical expertise to change so if for example you ask an engineer to design a bridge over a, a wide river he, he, he or she can do that uh, um, a marketing manager can develop a plan for a new product rollout. A, a finance manager can develop a forecast for a budget. But these are technical challenges that require functional expertise. Um, in complex ecosystems, change is usually much more challenging than that because it's not just a technical challenge. It's an ecosystem challenge where you have to uh, deploy group intelligence in order to be able to shift the group from point A or enable them to to go to from point A to point B. So the reasons I think, or the main reason that most change efforts fail, is that people don't manage that complexity. They don't understand group dynamics, and they don't know how to intervene in groups in a way that enables them to undergo change. So. Usually when you're in change management, it's a change in my understanding. It's usually a change in strategy. I got to get from at point A and I have to get to point B. Mm. So I have to make some changes and I have to be able to implement the changes. Mm. What is it that you found? What is it that the implementation, the change in the mindset of the people, just the whole GQ starts changing and moving? What, what do you think the skills an individual needs to develop would be to be able to manage that change and make that new strategic direction? Yeah, I think you've got to firstly see the reality of what is actually happening. That is one of the, the first the first things you've got to be able to do. You've got to be able to notice what, what is happening and be able to deal with, with the, that reality and see those big patterns. And often that's what we're not wired to do. We're not wired to see those patterns in the ecosystem, a bit like Albert Borla at Pfizer. He he came into this ecosystem. He was a vet by background, veterinary surgeon. So he wasn't from big pharma. And when he went into the industry and became the CEO of Pfizer, he could see with fresh eyes so he could see that there was this siloed nature where everybody was working in in isolation essentially so being able to see the ecosystem with fresh eyes is one of the the biggest elements of of GQ the the second one then is to be able to design interventions that are going to work um a lot of us have been taught 
that you know organizations are like machines um so what what do we do we pull levers for change we we drive hard for change we we push um, but actually in complex human ecosystems those interventions can backfire the more you push hard for change the more the system resists that change so you've got to be able to design interventions that are not going to bring up resistance in in the ecosystem and then the third element is mm -hmm. to be able to intervene or nudge and um, to keep the pressure on for change to keep the system moving in the right direction so those are three of the things i talk in the hive mind at work and the the way the way that uh, leaders with high gq operate so they they really see the system they look beyond they they have this ability to design powerful interventions and they are able to intervene in systems uh, to enable them to accelerate change without bringing up resistance so in your mind what can a leader do when workplace change is just going too slow because the pace of change today is pretty fierce. Sorry, could you repeat that question? I just lost you there for five seconds. Yes. What, what can a leader do when workplace change is too slow, given that today the pace of change is pretty fierce? Yes. So if it's too slow, one of the things to do as a leader is to step back and not make assumptions about why it's too slow. You've actually got to dig underneath um, and discover what is the reason for the, the lack of acceleration of the change, because it could be a multitude of reasons. So what leaders tend to do is they've got a hammer and they go in with the hammer, but you've got to actually understand what, what, what are the collective assumptions that are held in this ecosystem that are preventing change from happening. So in uh, one organization I was working in, a, an engineering company, you know, one of the, the assumptions that was held in that company, they were trying to move to more technology enabled services, but everybody was um, waiting for the change to pass. So there was this lying low pattern where people would duck down, lay low and hope that that change would pass by and then it would all go back to business as usual. So that was the collective assumption. That was the big pattern that was running the organization. And once you realize that that's what's going on, then how you intervene in that ecosystem as a leader might be very different. So you'd be signaling to the system that this is not a change that's going to go away. This is something I'm very committed to. This is um, something that if you get on board, you're going to be rewarded, et cetera. So that's, that's a different um, intervention than, let's say, outright um, people who, who might be objecting in other ways to a change. So you, you need to understand what the collective assumptions are in order to be able to intervene in the most appropriate way, I would say, to that question, Ted. Mm -hmm. So help me understand, I believe what you might be saying also is you need a big picture, small picture. You need the intervention to go at the local level with the individual, but you need to see the big picture of the hive mind, if you will, and understand here's how I direct change through that hive mind. Because then I got the whole organization working the way I want to, and we're all mm. working more congruently with each other. Am I correct in thinking that? Yeah, yeah. I think you've got to understand what the operating model is. And one of the analogies I use for this is when when the hive, the, 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 the bees are actually moving from one home to the other because the hive is crowded, they change their operating model. So they go from their daily operations into um, the queen becomes the director of the change, the 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 you know different bees step into role of scouts looking for a new home other bees step into role of protectors of the hive because the hive has to move to a temporary location so the whole hive changes how it's operating and different parts of the hive take up completely different roles in order to make this transition this dangerous transi transition to a new home and we've got to do the same in organizations we can't change without changing our operating model and if you look at 
any successful business today, you will see that they take, they enact change by reframing and taking up a change operating model. So you've got to look at that, the, the, the operating model that uh, you're going to use in order to make change happen, not just the structure. So a lot of leaders go straight to restructuring, mm -hmm. but it actually goes strategy, operating model, structure. You've got to look at your operating model. So yeah, change happens at multiple levels, but at the systemic level, it's about the operating model. That's excellent. Great. I have to ask you a personal question. What was the experience like and what were your thoughts and feelings when you found out that Professor John Cutter was going to use your work as a Harvard Business School case study? Well, I was sitting in my office at the ANZ Bank when reception called through and said, I've got John Cotter on, on the line. And I nearly fell off my chair because I'd read all of his books and he was such a mentor to me. And um, I, I was really gobsmacked and uh, they patched him through to me. And he basically explained how he was looking for best practice global examples of change and word of the work that we were doing at the ANZ Bank had, had gotten through to him and uh, we prepared a case study. I prepared a case study on the work that we were doing and he used that to teach MBA students at Harvard. So, uh, and the bank, it was a remarkable turnaround because we had uh, gone from the worst performing bank in the country to the number one bank on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index in seven years, led by CEO John McFarland. So, and I, I was... Um, one of the team uh, in, in the transformation team. And then I led that team for a number of years. So it was um, a remarkable and often, you know, what I say about change is it's always co-created. So there was um, mm -hmm. a whole team of people and all the different parts of the bank took up its role in order to make that change happen. I think one of the things we're taught about change is that it's a single hero will come in on, on the charger and, and save the day. And it's um, that's uh, hardly ever the case. It's, uh, well, all parts of the ecosystem need to take up their role. Yeah. So what do you see in business in the future changing? What do you, how do you see the beehive concept and the, the GQ actually coming in and affect business? Will it be accepted? What will happen? Because we are living in times of extreme changes with AI coming in and everything else. What do you see for the future? Yeah, I, I do see that we, in a sea of change, we are drowning, I say. Mm -hmm. And the intelligences that we have uh, developed are inadequate for the times that we are facing. So we have IQ, great for problem solving, great for technical um, problems like designing a bridge or developing a budget or rolling out a product launch plan. Um, EQ, uh, a great skill if you want uh, to understand people's emotions, your own emotions, that self-awareness. But these two skills are inadequate for complex ecosystem change. So this is where I think GQ, group intelligence, is required at the individual and collective levels. Um, but it's it takes time to rewire your brain to think in this way. It's not something that we're taught. So we, we have to rewire for the systemic. We have to rewire for the collective. We have to understand the parts and the whole. We have to see patterns. These are not things that we've been taught to do. So yes, it's hard. It's going to be hard work, but uh, is it going to be worth it if, if, if you want to manage in these more complex times? If you want to take groups on a journey, then these are essential skills. Okay, so I think that your work is a tremendous contribution, and I think the GQ, GQ, GQ concept is one that really defines, in effect, new leadership roles, moving beyond your own ego. It's a group effort. I have to look and see how the whole hive's working and look for the benefit for them. So um, I want to thank you very much for your time. You have fascinating background, very impressive. The book, a must read in my mind, great concept. The new, it's a new idea, the whole GQ concept. And I, I really applaud you for that. So I want to thank you for being a guest on the episode of uh, The Implementers yeah. and uh, look forward to future contact and conversations with you. Thanks so much, Ted. Hi, 
Ted Wolf here. I want to thank you for joining us for this implementer's video. The implementer's podcast is presented by Guidewise, where we, along with our vetted member community, recognize that ideas are easy, but implementation is hard. To learn more about getting things done with Guidewise, please visit us at guidewise.io. And to conquer your implementation struggles, please like and share this video and subscribe to our channel. Happy implementing.